Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Wednesday video. Today, we are joined by another expert. Uh, we're very kindly joined by our guest today being Trent Hone. Um, would you uh, like to introduce yourself to the viewers? Sure, absolutely. Uh, first, let me say thank you for having me on. It's quite exciting to be here. I am, uh, well, I have uh, several hats that I wear, but I am a naval historian. I've won several awards for my work and recently in 2018 published a book called Learning War through the Naval Institute Press. And it has uh, been on a number of reading lists and received attention from modern naval officers, uh, both in the United States and in other countries around the world. I, I believe that there are some fans of it in Australia, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm quite pleased with that. Uh, and I've got uh, some other works coming out, which uh, we may talk about in the future, but I don't know, don't have dates for them, don't have uh, a specific publication schedule, so I'm going to hold off on announcing any of that, but I just want people to know that I'm still quite busy. And then as a day job, I, I work as a consultant and help organizations get better at what they do, uh, primarily from a software perspective. Fair enough. That sounds... Uh... Yeah, that's 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 a field of things that uh, I'm I'm not quite as okay with. So I I, I will bow to your expertise in that field. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be talking about the development of U.S. Navy tactics um, and doctrine in this section up until World War Two, and then in a future section we talk about how that had further evolved during World War Two itself. Um, and of course, you know. Okay, let's get an early plug in. If you want to know more details, you must go and buy Learning War because, <laughs> you know, that's got all the extra details in it. <laughs> um, so I guess to start off, um, what was the state of the US Navy and its plans for conflict in the 1890s as it kind of enters the world stage as a as a great power? Quite rudimentary, actually. Um, so the the war with uh, Spain is a pretty significant marker here. It occurs in 1898. Uh, the United States Navy had been preparing for conflict with Spain or potentially some other European power in, in the years leading up to it. Uh, but those preparations are not very thorough. Uh, the ships of the United States Navy are distributed around the world in a variety of squadrons and stations. There is no centralized battle fleet that comes together and, and practices on a regular basis. They they do come together occasionally uh, for combat training, but uh, when they do, it's pretty obvious that they haven't worked out all the details about how to work together. Uh, so so tactical development is is relatively limited, and uh, there are some things that contribute to this. Uh, there are a lot of debates in the U.S. Navy at the time about the influence of new technology, not only what to do with it, but how to integrate it into the Navy, uh, into the Navy system, particularly its officer promotion system. So uh, at the time, officers were divided into a number of different groups. There were line officers who commanded ships, you know, they could command in, in battle. And then there were engineering officers who knew how to deal with steam engines and all the other new mechanisms uh, from electricity to, uh, to propulsion that were necessary to make these new ships run. The ships of the new steel navy uh it's called and you couldn't be an engineer and command ships and so there's a conflict here those officers who were learning more about engineering uh learning about the details of these new technologies they were a bit disgruntled they wanted more recognition of their skills and capabilities uh and it, it would not be until after the war with spain that the u.s navy really integrates uh, these two forms together and insist that, uh, you know, for future uh, officers, they're going to have to be, you're going to have to have an engineering background. You're going to have to understand how these technologies work. And uh, the today, the U.S. Naval Academy is thought of as an engineering school. Uh, but prior to this time, that would not have applied. Um, the education would have been much more traditional, uh, much less based in engineering. Um, but it was that change that came about in 1899, as I say, after the Spanish-American War that, it, that introduced that. Something else that is important to note is that war planning in the U.S. Navy was fractured and confused. There were a number of different groups that were responsible for it. Uh, the Naval War College had a plan for a war with Spain. Uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence had a plan for a war with Spain. They didn't match up. They didn't agree. Uh, and to help break the conflict, um, the head of the Bureau of Navigation uh, agitated to create his own uh, war plan. And uh, so when war 
has come in 1898, the uh, Secretary of the Navy, John Davis Long, is confronted with these three different plans and realizes pretty quickly, I've got to choose and I don't really have the know-how in terms of how navies will fight or operate uh, to know how best to do this. Uh, he has a capable assistant secretary, a man named Theodore Roosevelt, who will become more important mm-hmm. later in the Navy story. Um, but he creates a temporary board, the Naval War Board, to help advise him, Long does, uh, about how to, how, to, how to wage the Spanish-American War. And that's a, a very interesting, very interesting milestone. Okay. So they, they, sort of, they get through the Spanish-American War. Obviously, they win um, with... Uh, a, f- a few mildly amusing incidents. Um, I'm always reminded of, of, of one of the battles of uh, poor old USS Brooklyn being caught somewhat on the hop and having to go charging off after the Spanish on half her boilers, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which I suppose is probably possibly a, a, a factor, an example of that, you know, engineering command divide <laughs> going on. But then once you come out of that, as you mentioned, Theodore Roosevelt becomes president. Um, how much of a sea change for the U.S. Navy is Roosevelt, who's obviously a big Navy man? Um, and then obviously that l- leads in during his period that the starts the U.S. Navy on its course of taking its place in the pre-dreadnought building race as well. So what changes? <laughs> well, one of the most significant changes is is a product of uh, John Davis Long's learning during the Spanish-American War. So he forms that Naval War Board which helps him understand how best to use the Navy uh, in the Spanish-American War. They, they win, as you, as you noted, mm-hmm. um, but it's challenging. And Long had been uh, an opponent of some kind of uh, naval general staff, just some uh, U.S. naval officers were agitating for. But he thought the board was a good mechanism. So he repeats that model and introduces in 1900 the general board, which is an advisory body of of senior officers to the secretary of the Navy. And Long thinks this will work because it's just an advisory group, right? It's not a naval general staff. It doesn't have a command function, but it does start to think about what does the Navy need to do for the future, to prepare for the future. Uh, Maybe there will be a conflict in the future against a European power that's much more capable than Spain. Uh, And the Spanish-American War illustrates just how unprepared the U.S. Navy was for conflict. So that is a that is a danger. Uh, And the general board also starts to think about, well, what what should a building program look like? What should the Navy look like? What kind of a structure do we need? They thought it would make sense to have a fleet of 48 battleships. Sometimes this is tied to, well, you know, there's eventually going to be 48 states, so maybe a, 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 a battleship for every state. Uh, but they think that's a, a, a good number to, to aim at. You mentioned the pre dreadnought building race, though. There are things that prevent this from uh, coming to fruition, one of which is um, the Congress is not going to appropriate the necessary number of ships to build at that rate. Um, there are a number of ships that, that they get appropriated during Roosevelt's time. Um, but it, technology also changes very quickly, right? So during Roosevelt's tenure, uh, the Navy is building ships quite quite rapidly. Got a note here. Yeah, so eight pre-dreadnoughts, six dreadnoughts, the, the U.S. Navy's mm-hmm. first, and four large armored cruisers. These are all appropriated during, during, during Roosevelt's um, two terms in office which is quite a bit. But what's happening is the Navy's building these faster than it can really gain experience with them. It it takes a long time to uh, appropriate a ship and then design a ship. Some of these ships take far too long to to design. They take two years to work out the designs. And then uh, once it gets into service, uh, only then do you begin to get some experience with it. And by then, you may be you know, four or five years past when you were originally conceiving it. And given the pace of technology in this time, a lot of these ships are more or less obsolescent by the time they actually hit the water, by the time they're commissioned and, and, and part of the fleet. Now, a key thing that Roosevelt does, though, to gain some more experience um, and help is uh, he installs um, or helps ensure that uh, William S. Sims is installed as the inspector of target practice in 1902. And um, that's really important because uh, gunnery during the Spanish-American War hadn't been very good. And Sims now has some license to uh, change processes, change procedures. He had met with uh, Captain Percy Scott on the Asiatic station, 
he learns uh, how to do continuous aim and how to teach uh, continuous aim. So that's introduced, but that provides a foundation. And on top of that, the U.S. Navy introduces a series of gunnery exercises that are more consistent that begin to advance the state of the art of gunnery in the U.S. Navy uh, and improve it. it. It acts as a catalyst for some experimentation and, and for some improvement. So that's going on. Roosevelt forms the Atlantic Fleet in 1906. So we go from squadrons and stations distributed around the globe to a now there is actually a centralized battle fleet um, in a show of <clears throat> Authority and power. Roosevelt sends it around the globe. This is the voyage of the Great White Fleet. Uh, that starts in 1907. To to some degree, this is a clear signal to the Japanese. Hey, look, we can take our fleet and we can send it around the world. We're not going to get beat the same way the Russians did in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Uh, but it also um, initiates some diplomatic relationships, uh, specifically with Japan. Not long after the fleet visits Yokohama. Uh, the two nations come together and sign the Rute Takahira Agreement, basically um, allowing certain spheres of influence in, in the Pacific. And some authors think that this might have put off war between the two powers for a number of decades. Um, and finally, one of the things that, that Roosevelt does is he, given the fact that some of these ships that are entering the fleet aren't up to date in terms of technology, don't really meet the requirements for operating in the fleet. In 1908, he holds a special conference in Newport at the Naval War College to review current designs, uh, but also review the process of designs. And what happens as an outcome of that is that the general board becomes responsible for working with a new organization um, called the Preliminary Design Section, which can employ, I think, fairly modern techniques in terms of rapidly iterating through design alternatives to get a sense of what is actually possible and more quickly arrive at a, a design that meets what the board thinks the Navy is going to need. And you can see a significant change with this because the, the battleships that come before that are designed in the earlier mechanism, um, those are up through uh, essentially the Arkansas class. They're more traditional looking uh, dreadnoughts, uh, aside from the the first American dreadnoughts, the the South Carolina class, the, these are all have you know an additional gun amidships, and then the standard type is introduced with the first ships that go through this new process, the the Nevada class, and not only do they look a bit more conventional, you know, four turrets, two in the uh, front, two in the rear, uh, but also they have an armor scheme which is designed to account for the longer range that guns can reach now, uh, which the prior ships did not. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded on sort of two of the points you raised there, one of which in terms of the pace of technology, the Great White Fleet involved a couple of pretty new, when they set out, newly commissioned pre-dreadnoughts. And by the time they come back, they've learned a whole bunch of lessons on sea keeping, but everything's advanced so much, they're only able to actually introduce the lessons that they're applying on, I think, the third class of dreadnoughts, because the South Carolinas and the Delawares are already under construction, so it's too late for them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I suppose you see the um, what you were saying in the latter part of that about the the new design process in the the Spring Styles books from the 1910s. There's so many sub variants that they've designed of what could possibly be our next generation of ship. And then they're all coalescing into one, whether it's a Nevada or a Pennsylvania or whatever class, as opposed to the, sort of the earlier design process where you sometimes see one design and it just goes through iteration after iteration after iteration as people add and take away and expand and contract things, um, which obviously, as you said, takes a lot longer. Um, but once you get into the 1910s, obviously the US Navy is, is growing. It's not necessarily growing as fast as it would like to or as fast as uh, some of the European navies are. But we know, for example, that Germany had a possibly somewhat fanciful war plan with the US to show up off the New York coast with the high seas fleet and invade. And then I think the plan probably is one of those ones that just ends with question mark at the yeah. end. <laughs> Invade, we dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah, We have invaded the, um, something. We win, hopefully. <laughs> um, how serious were the US Navy's plans to fight off that kind of mass coastal assault from a European power in the 1910s? Or had they kind of just looked at it and gone, that's never going to happen? 
Well, they look at it quite seriously. Um, and I think we can get a sense of some of the seriousness that the, the U.S. Navy and the, the United States puts behind this uh, in the response to the, the Venezuelan crisis of uh, late 1902, early 1903. Right? The, there is a real fear that the Germans are going to try to use that crisis as an excuse to try to occupy some part of Venezuelan territory. And so President Roosevelt concentrates the fleet puts Admiral George Dewey in charge of it. And, and all of this is a very clear signal, not just to the Germans, they were perceived as the greatest threat, but other European powers um, don't, don't violate the Monroe Doctrine here. We are serious, we will, we will fight. Uh, we may not be capable <laughs> of beating a co coalition of European powers if it comes to that, um, but th we believe this is in our national interest and we're going to, we're going to protect it. Um, and so in the 1910s, you know, the Navy has advanced beyond what it could do in, in 1902, 1903. The Atlantic fleet exists. It has been exercising. Uh, it is getting more sophisticated in terms of its um, trials and routines. But what is really lacking is the ability to locate uh, an, an approaching enemy fleet. So, you know, if the Germans were to have sent a, a squadron or a fleet across the Atlantic, the challenge that the that the United States Navy would have faced and that it knew it was going to face was how, how does it find it? How does it find it early enough to take some action against it um, before there's any landing on shore? And scouting forces are in, in short supply. You know, the, the European navies, um, the Royal Navy, the High Seas Fleet, they're investing in light cruisers that can scout and then that can scout in decent seas. Right. I mean, very high seas are going to slow those those scouts down, but but they still can maintain their speed in a decent seaway. Um, the United States Navy is primarily relying on destroyers uh, because it has very limited uh, scouting forces. When the negotiations with Congress occur, the Navy is more interested in getting battleships than it is scouting forces. Uh, so smaller destroyers are pressed into this role and they just can't they can't do it. Uh, the North Atlantic often prevents them from from uh, keeping their speed up uh, and and it's very difficult for them to search effectively. Now one thing that I think is quite interesting is uh, the Navy thought that it would be more likely, you know rather than the Germans coming to the coast of New York or something like that, they thought it would be much more likely that the uh, the Germans or some European power would try to seize a base in the Caribbean. So a lot of the emphasis is not, I mean, there's some emphasis on protecting the East Coast, obviously, but it's more about, okay, if that happens, because you know, they expected that that could probably occur before it could be detected. If that happens, then what do we do? Oh, well, we'll have to go down there and we'll have to fight. So one of the uh, things that this spurs and is an interest in how do we get to the Caribbean, uh, establish our own base there, which is going to have limited facilities, but then operate you know, thousands of miles away from our main bases on the on the East Coast. And so it gets the Navy thinking about how how do we maintain uh, lines of communication and a fairly tenuous supply line to an advanced base and then use that uh, to operate at some distance from from our harbors and our in our main bases. Now, some th that becomes very important later, right, when they begin thinking more seriously about a Pacific War. Um, but the point that I want to make is that they're considering this, you know, early in the 20th century, often um, earlier than, than many people would give it credit for. OK. Um, and obviously, as World War One breaks out, then you've got the the British are having to, well, they don't have to, but they end up suspending their battleship building program because they think the war's not going to last particularly long. Uh, the Germans, of course, more by resource re reallocation to suspend theirs. So you've got the Queen Elizabeth and the Revengers, which are approximately sort of Nevada and Pennsylvania contemporaries, and Biodens are kind of in that same slot. But the US Navy, not involved until 1917, is able to continue expanding its dreadnought fleet through the 1914, 15, 16, et cetera, building programs. So what changes is the US Navy making to its fleet whilst everybody else is blowing up each other's ships and not <laughs> having their major building programs on hold? <laughs> there, there's quite a bit going on. 
during this time period in the U.S. Navy. It's a, it's an exciting time to study. Uh, and one of the things that has been very interesting to me is uh, the reports that come from Europe, from the fighting in Europe, and and how much of an impact they have, uh, because it really challenges existing assumptions. You know, I mentioned battle practices before. So the Navy's engaging in these battle practices, but then what they see from Europe is, uh, wow. Uh, ships are going to shoot each, each other at much longer ranges than we had anticipated, you know, 20,000 yards or so. Uh, they're going to seem much faster than we'd anticipated. Uh, you know, the Battle of Dogger Bank is a great example in, in this regard. Now, obviously, battle cruisers are involved there. It's not a clash of battle lines, but the U.S. Navy looks at that and goes, wow, um, we're going to have to think about this differently. We're going to have to learn how to hit at longer ranges. We're going to have to learn how to fight at higher speeds. We, we've got to improve our capabilities in this regard. And that spurs an interest also, or reinforces an interest that already existed, you know, because large uh, armored cruisers had been built um, about a decade before. But now the U.S. Navy is starting to think seriously about, well, you know, maybe a battle cruiser would be a good idea to have. And you mentioned spring styles. There are a lot of different alternatives being entertained about what would a U.S. Navy battlecruiser look like and how would it fight. And the evidence from Europe suggests it would be advantageous to have one. So that begins to, to be considered more, more seriously. Uh, at the same time, the Navy is devoting significant attention about how to, how to fight uh, as, a, as a fleet, you know, because now this experimentation in the Atlantic fleet is continuing. And it's really spurred in large part uh, by William Sims. Again, he was doing gunnery work. He, after that, goes to the Naval War College, studies there, meets some like-minded individuals, one of whom is Dudley Knox. Dudley Knox is writing and thinking about this thing he calls doctrine. And the way he thinks about it is a way to lend cohesion to a force or a formation without precise instructions. So how do we come together uh, get a shared sense of how we want to fight, and then actually go do that, do that in a in a fleet exercise. So Sims comes to the Atlantic Fleet, assumes responsibility for the torpedo flotilla, brings Knox with him, and they use it as a laboratory to explore how to make this concept of doctrine work, which was new to the U.S. Navy at the time. And they do quite well. And a whole series of exercises, they... Um, Prior to the exercise, they'll bring the, the various captains of these small ships, the torpedo boats or torpedo boat destroyers together, familiarize them with the upcoming contacts, develop a plan, rehearse it, you know, war game it, and then uh, go out and, and execute it. And that familiarization that they go through gives them a shared sense of how to act. So they can uh, engage in night tactics or they can fight with some level of cohesion that is often missing from other elements of the fleet. And they demonstrate this repeatedly in exercises. A few years later, mm -hmm. uh, Frank Friday Fletcher is in charge of the Atlantic fleet, and he builds on this, or at least enhances it, with this idea of uh, new, a new set of battle instructions. When we go to battle, we'll have a plan. Fletcher doesn't specify what exactly the plan is going to be, but... He says, we'll have a plan, and the plan is going to depend on circumstances, but but I'll, I'll promulgate it. And so he's relying on this idea that there will be uh, doctrine, so these smaller groups will know how to fight together because they will, will have developed some level of unit cohesion, and then we'll have an overarching plan that will guide their individual action in combat to a, to a common end. And these things become part of the Navy's approach to tactical combat uh, for the next 30 years. Also, uh, the Navy is improving its ability to hit accurately at longer ranges. So driven by this need to shoot at longer ranges, guided or harnessed by the gunnery exercises that are going on, they build uh, or contract to the Ford Instrument Company run by Hannibal Ford, not Ford the automaker, uh, to build something they call a range keeper which, you know, is an electromechanical computing device that figures out the fire control solution. Uh, and it is trialed uh, in 1916, proves effective, and begins to get adopted and integrated into the fleet. So there's a lot of work going on to improve the fighting effectiveness of, of the U.S. Navy and also consideration of uh, what it's going to need to do in the future. One other thing worth mentioning, you talked about continuing to build battleships. Absolutely. 
and they begin to experiment with new propulsion mechanisms. So Battleship New Mexico ushers in the turbo electric drive, which is going to be the standard going forward for the standard battleships the the, the Tennessee and Colorado classes and also be entertained for those that are uh, appropriated under the 1916 bill. And a big piece of the uh, concept there is just to improve the the fuel efficiency of these ships because now they're starting to think not only would we might might we have to steam to the caribbean and fight uh, but maybe we're going to have to steam to the western pacific maybe we're going to have to fight japan uh, and if we do that we're going to need significant range so we have to get as much you know mile out of out of every uh, barrel of fuel oil as we can Turbo electric drives is a way they think to do, to help achieve that. Yeah, it's um, something that uh, some turbo electric drive ships, as you mentioned, some of the ones appropriated in the 1916 bill, like Lexington and Saratoga. Uh, Saratoga, perhaps more so than Lexington, you can <laughs> see a, a fair bit of that steaming around the Pacific in uh, World War Two. So speaking of that 1916 bill, um, how much of the uh, U.S. Navy's expansion plans were driven by politics and how much was driven by themselves when it comes to, to to this bill? Are they kind of left going, oh, we have money now. We don't know. We don't know what this feels like. The Congress is being generous for once um, while frantically looking in the Book of Revelations to find out if this is a sign of the apocalypse um, or, or were they kind of driving this? saying we want more money, we want to expand and have, sort of have a plan in place ready for when Congress decides to open the floodgates. Oh, they, they, they have a plan. Um, so the division between politics and the Navy de depends a little bit on where you want to you want to draw that line, because the, the journal board is thinking uh, politically or, or maybe uh, geostrategically is a better way to put it. Um, they had been advocating for a 48 ship battleship fleet for some time. That's not going to be achieved, but they renewed the call for that in 1915. Like, no, we want to get to 48 ships. We'd like to get there by 1920. So we want an accelerated building program. We want more ships to, to get there. Um, the political concern, which the uh, the board is mindful of, is that maybe the, Euro the European war seems to be causing them to think about a number of different alternatives, all viewed from you know what are the worst things that could happen from the perspective of the United States. Uh, one thing they're worried about is, well, maybe Japan is going to switch sides. Maybe they will ally with Germany, and then we will be faced with this you know hostile coalition: the Germans on one side and the Japanese on the other. Uh, and maybe there will be a truce in Europe, uh, so they'll be able to fight us alone. You know, right? Maybe the the other European powers are going to be exhausted and um, end the war. So they're worried about potentially the war ending and Germany and Japan being hostile, fighting, having to fight, you know, in, in both theaters at, at once. Now, that's rather fanciful, right? But that doesn't mean it wasn't being talked about as a, as a potential, which gives you some sense of you know, sort of where the, the uh, some of the people in the general board where their head might have been. Um, the other challenge is, well, maybe we'll get pulled into the war. Right. Maybe we're just, you know, because in 1915, Lusitania is sunk, the, the Germans uh, political opinion is very much turning against them. Um, so maybe we'll get pulled into the war. If we get pulled into the war, uh, President Woodrow Wilson is thinking, well, if I have a large Navy, I have a little bit of a better bargaining chip. You know, maybe I can use that as leverage uh, to help ensure that the peace that ensues is more aligned to the interests of the United States going forward. And there's also a line of thinking that, well, no matter who wins this war, they're going to emerge uh, more dominant in Europe. And that means that eventually there's going to be a conflict between them and the United States for economic dominance of the world. And so we have to have a Navy that is not only going to be able to allow us to fight Germany and Japan at the same time, but also that could allow us to fight the Royal Navy you know, the English, uh, mm -hmm. if, if necessary. Um, so that's where this Navy second to none argument comes from. And what's interesting is they've submitted what they think, you know, they can get out of Congress. 
um, and it's less than what is actually appropriated. And I think part of the reason is that the House of Representatives is debating the bill at the same time the Battle of Jutland is fought, which raises the visibility of um, battle fleets, uh, what they can do, what they potentially might not be able to do. And, and I think that interest helps prompt Congress to say, well, we'll give you even more than you had initially asked for. Like, I mean, having a Navy second to none is going to be important. So here, here's an awful lot of money. Build, you know, the South Dakota class battleships, build the Lexington battle cruisers, and build all these other supporting forces that you've been asking for for years. Yeah. And, um, and then, of course, everyone's happy everyone's building plenty of ships and then government changes the new the new administration is somewhat more insular looking and of course that coincides as well with the washington naval treaty so suddenly the happy times are over <laughs> um, how do they reorgan how does the u.s navy reorganize its its ambitions then in the face of the washington treaty now that they they have to settle with only being parity with britain yeah, uh, this is really very important uh, for the development of the Navy and, and um, world history at this time. Um, one thing point I think is important to make is obviously the United States does enter the war. Um, the U-boat threat is much more serious than the United States Navy had anticipated. And so a lot of building resources and, and funds are reallocated away from these larger ships to smaller ones that can help in that fight. So destroyers, vice, um, battle cruisers or battleships. Mm -hmm. So by the time the treaty comes along, you know, they haven't completed any of those large ships. Uh, they haven't even completed one of the earlier um, battleships of the, of the Colorado class. There were supposed to be four of those. It only ended up being three because Washington is, is canceled as part of the treaty. And it does a, a lot of different things. So by now, the U.S. Navy is seriously starting to think about, well, we will probably have to fight Japan eventually. Um, well, Japan is still allied with Great Britain. That's a problem. But the treaty provides a way to, to break that. You know, that alliance is formally renounced. So Japan is split away from Great Britain. That creates a little bit more geostrategic space for the United States Navy to think about how to fight the Japanese. Uh, but they have to abandon a plan that they have. You know, there had been plans. We will turn Guam into a fortress. Uh, we will reinforce our bases in the Philippines. This will make it easier for those locations to hold out in the event uh, of a war. If the Japanese initiate something and we would will um, send the fleet to the West and it will operate from there. Well, uh oh, the treaty says we can't do that. There's <laughs> this non fortification clause. Yikes. Uh, OK, <laughs> but because there's a enforced ratio as you mentioned right parity between um the royal navy and the u.s navy um but the japanese are relegated to second class there the, the five five three ratio in terms of, of capital ships so because the japanese battle line is smaller um the u.s navy still thinks well we won't have these western pacific bases but since we're stronger we can probably just steam across the pacific and win a battle line action and then ultimately uh, establish a base that allows us to impose a blockade of Japan. So this is the early war plan orange concept. Um, Ed Miller in his his book on it uh, calls this group sort of the thrusters. You know, we're going to move across the Pacific very quickly. Uh, and that paradigm dominates uh, roughly until until 1934. And one of the reasons it dominates is because um, well, the, the, the treaty ratios, um, confidence that the, that the Navy could do this, but it, it is abandoned in large part because the Japanese have dominion over what are called the mandates. And these are former German island possessions in the Central Pacific, the, the Marshalls, the Marianas, uh, and the Carolina Island groups. And the, the Navy sees this sort of in two, two ways. One, you know, some, some of the officers who I think are a little bit more forward-looking and more astute realize oh, if these are Japanese possessions, we might be able to capture them. That might be advantageous to us in a war. Uh, and some of the others realize, particularly as airplanes develop in their capability, wow, <laughs> the Japanese are going to be able to base planes on these. Those planes and maybe submarines at some of these remote anchorages are going to be able to attack the fleet. And by 1934, the war games have shown that, okay, even if you can steam across the Pacific relatively quickly, the attrition you suffer on the way there is going to be severe. 
Uh, the Japanese may be defeated in a battle line action, but their ships are going to be able to return to harbor and get repaired. Ours won't. Um, so that's going to leave them in a state to dominate the Western Pacific. We're essentially going to lose the war. We'll send the fleet across the Pacific and we'll lose the war. Um, so now attention turns to uh, these island groups, the mandates. And, ah, OK, well, if we seize a base in the mandates, then we can move more incrementally. And, and Miller calls this the cautionary strategy. And it, it comes to the fore in 1934. Now, also, uh, and John Kuhn has written pretty extensively on this. He's got a book, The, the Agents of Innovation, uh, which looks at how the treaty, particularly the, the non-fortification clause, influences um, and drives the thinking in the Navy to, OK, if we can't have a base in the Western Pacific, we have to bring the base with us. So how do we create the logistical capability? How do we create um, everything that we need to bring everything that um, that we're going to have to fight with with us uh, across the Pacific? So this the mobile basing capacity um, is catalyzed by the Washington Treaty as as well. So it sets up a lot of the things that, that we ultimately see in World War II in the Pacific. Um, but it takes a while to to think it all through. Mm. Um, so once you're sort of, you've got your battle fleet, there's various ways of organizing it. Obviously, everyone has their own ideas how that's going to happen. Um, in the interwar period, the U.S. Navy has this scouting force and a battle force, which they like playing around with in a lot of the fleet problems. Um, what's the objective of that particular fairly clear split between your scouting and battle forces during that period? The the naming gives us a very good clue, mm -hmm. right? So I, I mentioned earlier, you know, um, before World War One, the U.S. Navy has this problem, it, it, scouting. It's a very mm -hmm. serious problem. How do you find an enemy? And one of the reasons for this split is so that you have a group that is familiar with how to how to scout and how. Uh, an enemy force. Um, airplanes were kind of limited in, in their capability through much of the interwar uh, period. They obviously they, their capability increases, but the, the scouting force is based around uh, some of the treaty cruisers. Right. This is another important implication of the treaty. You can build 10,000 ton uh, cruisers, but you can't build anything uh, much larger. All the major navies begin to invest in these. Uh, the U.S. ones are they very much emphasize firepower and speed and range. Um, particularly the earlier ones, don't have a great deal of armor. Uh, but they form uh, part of the anchor of the scouting force. The scouting force also includes um, some of the more modern destroyers. And the intent is to be able to use it, you know, the airplanes on the cruisers, um, the destroyers, uh, later on augmented by patrol planes to seek out and find the enemy. And one of the things that I think is quite interesting is, is there's obviously an intention not just to find, you know, not just to locate the enemy fleet, uh, but there's a lot of investment in something called the night search and attack, which had been developed before the uh, United States entry into World War One, but it gets really sophisticated in the interwar period. Uh, procedures are developed to create scouting lines so that you can sort of search where you think the enemy is going to be. Once you find them, um, you, they're assuming you're going to be finding a screened force, so it's not just uh, isolated enemy ships, it's a, it's a screen disposition. There are formations for entering or fighting your way through that screen disposition. These uh, bring together cruisers and, and destroyers, particularly these heavy cruisers. Um, the intention is to use their guns to shoot through the enemy screen, punch a hole. The destroyers would enter the enemy formation and then attack heavy ships at its center with torpedoes. They model this, uh, they experiment with it in, in fleet problems. Now, those obviously have limitations. You're not actually shooting. Uh, the pace of some of those actions are a little bit different uh, than what you would actually see in, in combat. But the intention here to use heavy cruisers and destroyers together to penetrate an enemy formation and then also to collaborate with patrol planes. Um, these are all interesting pre-war explorations about how to bring these disparate units of the fleet together in, in, uh, cohesively um, that I think are quite interesting. And then they have some implications for how the Navy fights in, in World War II. It doesn't all work out this way, uh, but some of these antecedents, you can see their influence later on in like 1942 and 1943. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that explains that. It's just to say, it's there's 
all sorts of different theories going around in the in the interwar period of how they're going how people are going to find the enemy um but speaking of the interwar period there's a lot that's made in different books and different circles about the fairly sharp spike in tensions between the us and the uk in the late 1920s and some people say oh yeah well it was very close to war and just averted other people think you know there was never any real chance of of that happening as far as the u.s navy was concerned how serious were they when it came to potentially having to go into war with the british empire in the late 1920s i think most american naval officers did not think this was a serious possibility mm -hmm. uh, you don't see the kinds of i mean if, if you look at the orange plans it is very you know very focused on how are we actually going to fight a war? If you look at red plans, so red was the, the color um, for the British Empire. Uh, these are more thought exercises, you know, so um, they they engage in these, um, these sort of strategic problems and tactical problems at the Naval War College. Um, but it is it, it seems apparent from my reading and from others who I respect that this is more of well how how would we do this like it's another kind of scenario with different circumstances so it forces you to think about the problem in different ways but i don't think they're treating it very seriously uh, and i think this is really visible when it comes to tactical games you know one famous uh, battle that is refought is the the battle of sable island which is you know off the new england coast and um, that's where U.S. Navy comes together and fights um, the Royal Navy. And I think this is done and done uh, on a pretty regular basis because it gives officers a chance to exercise against a, a peer competitor. Right? It's a very different problem than if you're fighting the Japanese and their battle line is restricted to a smaller size. Uh, so if you're fighting the Royal Navy, you're fighting sort of, I mean, the ships have different capabilities. So obviously you have to figure out how are you going to leverage the strengths of yours and, and mitigate your weaknesses against the opponent. But you're fighting uh, uh, a sophisticated battle fleet that has almost equal capabilities. And I think that's a different challenge. And they wanted to exercise that challenge, wanted to understand, you know, how, how would we do this? Um, how do we make sure that we're thinking about all these different criteria? Um, and so... I think that's what you see. You see a lot of um, exercise that is more geared toward how do we think about this? How do we conceptualize it? How do we do this mentally? And less, how are we actually going to win a war with the with the British? Mm. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's. It, I must admit, it's what it's one of those areas of naval history that's somewhat. I wouldn't say niche, but it's it's less talked about. But when it does get talked about, it <laughs> suddenly provokes all sorts of riotous discussion in some quarters. Yeah. 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 Another uh, another thing to think about along uh, those lines that I think is quite interesting. I forget. Ah, uh, uh, I regret that I can't remember the exact year. But uh, at one point in the 30s, the U.S. Navy sends a fleet to Australia, and I think one of the things that's being considered is um i mean most of war plan orange assumes that the united states will fight japan on its own like each of them will be uh, alone there won't be any significant alliances involved uh, but i do think that there is an effort to try to ensure that there are friendly relations between the united states and australia um, not only because well we're all english-speaking peoples that's what uh, the uh, naval officers at the time were thinking um, but also you know suppose Japan does get aggressive. It might be nice to at least be friendly with the Australians, even if we're not allied with them. Um, and I think you see some of the, um, well, the harvest of some of those initial seeds that are planted uh, come about in, in 1942 with a quick collaboration that occurs there. So then I suppose that brings us up almost, almost at World War II, but um the the I suppose the Pearl Harbor attacks exemplify it, but it does exemplify an underlying issue from the late nineteen thirties when you have say Nevada gets underway, ends up having to beach itself, and in the sort of the the post mortem, if you like, it shows that actually a lot of the flooding that occurred was because it was actually in really bad shape internally. There were bulkheads that weren't sealing properly, holes that people had drilled randomly in in other parts of the ship that weren't supposed to be there, and things like this. And that applied to a fair number of the other ships that were there. 
So why were a lot of these older standard type battleships in relatively poor shape by the end of the 1930s? I, I think a lot of it has to do with how long it's been since they've been in any kind of major yard work. Um, so, uh, you know, thinking about Nevada, for example, she comes out of a, a major refit and reconstruction in early 1930. So, you know, that's 11 years if we're talking about then to 1941. Mm-hmm. Now, there had been smaller refits then, right? But 1930 is when she gets the tripod mass and the cage mass go away. She gets increased gunnery, gun elevation, uh, modern fire control systems, and, and other things. Uh, but Although there were conversations about giving these ships, particularly the the most recently built ones, uh, what are called the Big Five of the Maryland and Colorado classes, to give them some more serious refits in the 1930s, that it gets deferred uh, because uh, the emphasis comes to be on new construction, right? New construction is a way to help um, ensure that people get jobs uh, in the depression um, president roosevelt franklin roosevelt now is also interested in you know ensuring that there are, is a large enough navy uh, given the increasing uh, hostility of the global environment and so new ships new construction is emphasized over uh, refitting these these old ones uh, another thing that's been going on is there's additional things are being added to them like uh, radar uh, more anti-aircraft capabilities. Um, the United States Navy is learning some things from the Royal Navy and its experience in Europe. Um, airplanes are moving faster hit than anyone had really anticipated. Uh, and so well, we're going to put more stuff on the top side of, of these ships. And it's done in a little bit more of a haphazard way. And, and you see how the mindset shifts after Pearl Harbor, right? Main mass get cut down. To, to free weight, but also to uh, free up fields of fire, uh, and the Navy becomes a little bit more serious about about using these these, these ships. Um, you're right, though; um, these older ones, at least until they get reconstructed uh, after after Pearl Harbor, aren't thought of really as first rate uh, ships anymore. The New Mexicos are a slightly different category uh, because they were modernized l- uh, later in the 30s. Well, still relatively early in the decade, but later than these these other ships. And in 1942, they are definitely considered the most capable, uh, but there's still some apprehension about their torpedo prediction, about how survivable they are in in a modern combat. And and so, although they get sent to the the South Pacific, they don't they don't see any real serious action there. Um, and I think part of it is attention shifts to the modern battleships and what they can do. You know, their higher speed, they can move with the carrier groups. Um, and um, the war kind of leaves these ships behind in a way. I mean, they're still used, uh, perform very effective uh, service as fire, con- or as, uh, fire support ships, uh, and they also end up, end up fighting in a couple of different places, uh, but uh, not really the ship for World War II anymore. No. Uh, I do wonder sometimes if perhaps the the emphasis on as you say on new construction might have come about potentially because of their speed i know you mentioned that in terms of keeping up with the carriers but when you look at the the ships that were modernized by the other navies you've got the congos which were pretty fast already made even faster the italians took the duilias and the cavours and tend to be fair from fairly slow ships into relatively fast ships but by massive almost effectively rebuilds rather than modernizations and even when you look at what the british are doing apart from the battle crews, well, apart from Renown, um, the other three, Warspite, Valiant and Queen Elizabeth, they're all these 24, 25-ish knot ships. So although they don't improve the speed, I guess that speed is is still somewhat relevant as opposed to maybe a 21 knotter where, you, unless you're going to do go full Italian, <laughs> um, <laughs> you're not really going to ever get that up to a point where it's going to keep up with a Lexington or an Enterprise. No. Uh, so how does how do things how are the US Navy's tactics evolving at the outbreak of World War II? Because as you mentioned, they've got sort of war plan orange and it's started off as this whole we're gonna sail all the way across the Pacific and fight them in their own turf. And at this point it's now more of the, I guess what we later call the island hopping campaign. But with with the as you say, the lessons that are coming in from Europe, 
and the evolving threat they're seeing with the Japanese, the forward deployment of the base of the fleet to Pearl Harbor. What, how's the US Navy kind of seeing its itself and its tactics evolve into what they think is going to happen when World War II turn, show, shows up on their own doorstep? Well, I think the most important thing to consider in this perspective, and it's a main theme of uh, learning war, is that in the interwar period, the, the U.S. Navy develops a capacity for assessing lessons and learning. And it also comes to emphasize uh, a few core, I call them uh, heuristics, so uh, essentially subconscious decision-making um, assistance. Uh, basically, if you're in a situation, um, your mind will very quickly, uh, particularly if you've been in a situation like that before, use a heuristic to decide what to do. Um, I like the analogy of, you know, if you're working on a motorcycle or a car or something like that, you know, and you come across a bolt, you, you know what to do. You just mm -hmm. sort of extract the bolt. I mean, and even more complicated problems than that, sometimes you just, you just sort of attack it and then you if you had to explain it to someone, you might have to sort of think your way through how you got there, but you just very quickly, your mind uh, goes to certain solutions. And three, I think are most important here, the Navy was ag emphasizing aggressive action. So act aggressively to try to seize the initiative in battle. Uh, a good way to do that is to attack effectively first. Now, that's Wayne Hughes's term, um, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but he's written uh, or had written a series of books on naval tactics. Uh, I remember reading one of those in the 80s and being strongly influenced by it. Um, so naval officers of the late 30s and early 40s would have agreed with the basis, the basic supposition there, which is you, you want to hit the enemy before he can hit you and hard enough to make a difference. And then there's an emphasis on decentralized decision making, right? Because a, a very effective way to um, seize the initiative and to act aggressively is to encourage junior officers to um, make their own decisions and seize fleeting opportunities in battle. And that extends also to doctrinal development. Uh, one of the criticisms that is sometimes leveled against the U.S. Navy at this time is, is that there wasn't uh, a comprehensive uh, doctrine, and that's true. Uh, but it was deliberate because the intent was to ensure that smaller units like the torpedo flotilla in World, uh, prior to World War I could develop their own doctrines for how to fight. Um, so those are there. Uh, and I think the Navy was probably reaching its peak before it really started to expand uh, in terms of its fighting uh, capability, um, before it really started to expand in uh, the years just before World War II. Because if you look at uh, officers who are reminiscing on that time, either um, in their oral histories or in their later writings, they, they talk about how um, the Navy wasn't quite as prepared as they would like it to have been. And I think part of the reason is it's growing very quickly at this point, right? So they're bringing in reserve officers, they're bringing in new new recruits, new sailors into the fleet, and they're having to dilute the level of skill that they had achieved in, in order to bring these, these new people in. Uh, and so there's not quite as much time for the training or the training isn't quite to the same level as it was before. But the learning capability is still there. And once the war starts, they, they turn it on. They turn it on pretty quickly. Um, some things are getting more sophisticated. As I mentioned, they're learning from the Royal Navy. Reports from the Royal Navy are coming in about what modern aircraft attacks are like. Uh, and not unlike World War I, speeds are higher. Uh, and the danger is greater than anticipated. This starts to drive more thinking about how to more effectively hit fast moving airplanes. I mean, there are already some sophisticated fire control uh, computing systems in place, but um, the timing here is uncertain. I don't know if reports from the Royal Navy drive it or if it's just the, the US Navy's own initiative, but they begin to think about how they could create uh, simpler lead computing sites. Uh, that are going to, you know, allow you to to hit better with some of the uh, automatic weapons that are going to be put onto the fleet, like the 40 millimeter and the, and the and the 20 millimeter. So the learning system is starting to work, or is working. Uh, radar is coming into the fleet, uh, but its limitations aren't terribly well understood. 
uh, and some of the the, the level of, of of training is tapering off as the as the fleet grows. Uh, but what I think you see after the war begins is that that system gets harnessed relatively quickly to try to figure out how best to take existing pre-war approaches and adapt them now to this new wartime context. Okay, and um, so as that brings us up to you know, World War Two, so they've they've started off. 50 odd years before, as you said, as a kind of a, a small Navy, just trying to find their way in the world. And uh, they've gone through one major conflict on their own, another major conflict with allies and a few sm smaller conflicts in between. And it, the, the US Navy has grown very rapidly. I suppose this is what well, I suppose one of the things that people sometimes forget the sort of the Royal Navy got where it was for through several hundred years of constant expansion and fighting. And the US Navy has effectively gone from a somewhat glorified coastal defense force to coming up to be well, it's now on a par with and is soon to be the biggest Navy in the world in pretty much the space of the career of one particularly long serving officer. Um, so as they hit World War II, um, they've got a lot of ideas, they've got a lot of lessons, they've got a lot of ships, but they, a lot of it is going to change <laughs> as as yes. we as we head into the big war, as it were. Mm. So I suppose that's uh, probably a good place to leave it for today. So for those of you who want to know what happens next, spoilers, <laughs> America wins. <laughs> um, the, but, the Allies win. Yes, the Allies win. But how, how they get around to uh, doing that, is uh, something that we will look at in uh, another video. So thank you very much for the moment to Trent Hone for lending his expertise. And once again, for those of you um, who want to look into more detail on what we've just discussed, Learning War is available in all good bookshops, US Naval Institute Press, uh, Amazon, etc. across the world. Strongly recommend you uh, get a hold of your copy. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.